name's Lance, and welcome to Bundy Bear Shed. Well, what's happened this week? Well, I've got to change my name to Passion Fingers. Everything I touched was stuffed. You know, just have one of those weeks sometimes, don't you? The, um, yeah, I, I, for the workshop, um, the, there's an old fella that had an engineering shop in town for many years, Julesy, and he was a clever, clever bloke. And what he couldn't do with his old shapers and gear cutting machines and all that sort of thing, well, no one could do. And, and the story is many years ago, um, he had this big engineering business, and anyway, the government hit him up with tax or something or other, and he put like 40 men off and um, just wound the business down and um, do something something um, more manageable. Or that he didn't have so much hassle with unions and all the other rubbish. And um, but anyway, he, he made slashes. Um, I think in America and in England you call them toppers. You put them behind the tractors and you cut your grass. You, know, you, you run around the paddock and, and um, keep your paddock in order. And he used to make these slashes. And on the slashes he would have a, a steel disc a, a, a four or five foot wide or a beam, a slasher beam. And he would have a bolt that went up through there with a blade. And on the other end he would have a bush like this. And how it works is that there's a, a bolt, this is a 7-8 bolt, this one. There's a bolt that comes up in here and the hollow in there is to give the head some protection because this is on the bottom and the blade sits out here. So, so this gets knocked around an awful lot. And, um, and what happens if you have a shorter one, the head of the bolt just wears away. And when you come to change a blade or something like that, it's a bugger of a thing. You, you can't get a spanner on it, or if people let these wear down too far. But, but uh, anyway, it shows you very, very clever bloke. Um, he died some time back, um, a couple of years back, two or three years maybe by now. Um, worked right up till the end, and um, I believe he had prostate cancer. And, and anyway, he worked right up to the end. Clever, clever fella, and his his slashes. He didn't buy the blades, he used to make the blades, and he made a good blade. And, and, but what he did over the years, he had no standard. Um, he never standardised anything. And, and he used to go into his shop and he'd have a, an old plough disc sitting upside down with a pole in the middle of it with hooks out of it. And, and you'd have a look on there and you'd pick the blade. And, and you know, one might be five eighths longer than the other. Or, and there was just no standard over the time. He, he must have changed the way he did things or decided to do things and, and um, he used to use bear code boxes and, and things like that but, um, but now he's passed on we're, we're getting his customers coming in to the shop saying oh I've got a Schulze slasher and I need a blade or I needed this or I needed that and, um, and we find it's a bit of a battle sometimes to do it and sometimes the blades we have available to us to sell they're not the same length as Schulze's blades. And so often we're selling them a blade that's an inch longer and they've got to dock the, dock the end off in a drop saw or something like that so it doesn't hit the side of the slasher. So, so anyway, these, these bushes here, um, this is a big one. Um, the more common one I find nowadays is a three-quarter hole in the centre here. And um, with the three-quarter hole, you, obviously this hole drops down and so you can fit an inch and an eighth spanner or sock it in nice and neatly around it. And, um, and where, where the blade goes out, there's a hardened steel bush in here. And so you have your, your plate, a hardened steel bush that the blade pivots on, then this, and the blade pivots here. And so you've got a large surface area here. This is three inch, a large surface area here. Most, and most blades are three inches wide. So you're supporting the blade well, but the blade can still swing. There's, the bushes are slightly wider than the blade, so the blade can swing if you hit something. So, so anyway, in the process of making some of these, um, I came home early the other day to knock a few up. We had a couple of customers looking for some. I got that one done. I went to part the next one off and my little lathe shit itself. And so the motor started buzzing and, um, and yeah, so I, so I shut it all down. I've, I've, I've since put the little crane on the lathe and pulled it out. And, and check the motor out. And I had another motor here that um, I'd bought at some stage. And 
it's a two horsepower motor. Um, you can run it in forward or reverse, but um, I tried hooking it up yesterday, but the the mucking around with the switches, I, I couldn't quite understand it. Um, and I thought, well, I'd, I'd just chuck a new motor on if I had one, then I'd sort the other one out when time allowed. But um, I spent most of the day on this bloody thing, and um, the what I ended up doing it was a start capacitor. And every motor I had around here, I pulled apart to see if I had a spare start capacitor, and it was a it was a 150 microfarad um, start capacitor and everything else had a 200 so in the end late last night I thought well bugger this I'm going to put a 200 on and look the 200 works fine um, it starts it quickly and it's one of those motors where you use the start capacitor to get it going then you hear it click and that start capacitor comes out of the circuit I believe and you just use your I think it's a 20 microfarad um, for the standard windings you know for your standard running so so it, it cranks up quickly and then it clicks out so I don't think there's going to be any long term damage but in saying that I'll, I'll only use it today and then next week um, next week we'll get the correct parts it was just to just to get the lathe going to, to do some of these so but yeah well, one of those one of those weeks when everything you touch is tough and um, yesterday I was checking a few circuits out and um, I thought I'll go and get my digital multimeter so went to get the digital multimeter wouldn't start wouldn't work so I thought oh battery's flat probably so I have a brand new battery here so um, I went and got the brand new battery and put in it no good so I had another battery in a tension wrench went and got that no nah. <laughs> so it looks like my digital multimeter's gone and um, which I suppose I've had it for some time and um, then if you watched my video last week where I was driving around on the little John Deere tractor, um, between the shed and the house, there's about 200 metres, 200 yards, something like that. And you could see where I was driving along and the, I was driving towards the house and you'd go past the dams where the dog had to swim and, and all that. But um, what I have for that is sometimes I walk, if I need the exercise I walk, or I have a push bike, a mountain bike. and. I jump on the mountain bike and um, and head up and sometimes I haven't got a toilet down the back here and sometimes if nature calls you on the pushing, whoa, away <laughs> you go. And, um, and yeah, don't leave things too late. Getting your leg over that bike can be a bastard. But anyway, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, me, me push bike. Yeah, I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll grab me pushy. And I, I rode it last Monday up and back and I went to jump on my pushy. Not urgently, I might note. <laughs> and um, <laughs> flat tyre, so I thought, oh well, not to worry. So I, I do have a tube here, so I, I fixed that yesterday. And then, um, and then uh, a week or two ago, the boat trailer, I, I jumped up to unhook the battery charger off the boat, and I, I didn't, I had a ladder there, you know, but I couldn't get it round, I was too lazy. So, and so I, um, I jumped up on top of the, um, the, handle for the jockey wheel and um, when I come down instead of standing standing in the middle of the jockey wheel here like I thought I was I was standing here and that broke and I, I got a big tear in my guts and, and went to the doctor <laughs> went to the doctor last week and there's a big lump there he reckons oh well if it's no good he'll open it up and we'll, we'll have a look but anyway um, so yeah that broke so I, I, um, I got a new handle for that so that will go on to the boat trailer shortly um, from wrecking that and just cleaning up before I thought oh you know getting in behind the lathe I've moved a lot of swarth out and things like that to get in behind those machines because it's up against the wall and you can only sweep so far so I was cleaning up and trying to tidy things up a bit because I got a bit messy and my little edge um, center find edge technologies technology center finder was there and and I've had this for a while, I hadn't used it, but I see James Green using it, and um, I thought, I'm going to get that out and have another play, so I, I did. And um, anyway, this morning, um, I just bumped it off the lathe, it went on the floor, and that's come out. So, and I've swept the floor since, I thought, must be a little plastic bulb or something that holds the, holds the, um, holds the level in. And um, can't find it. 
So, but I've, I've swept the floor over. I got a soft broom and swept the whole area around here and had a good look before I put it in the bin. And so I don't know. I'll, I'll have to. I don't know if the little thing on the end was an eccentric, so it calibrated this or what. But I have a tool that I set up with it last week, and I know that tool will be right still. So um, I'll sit this in here and. Yeah, we'll just check that it's still right, back again. Had a visit from the neighbours, so we had to pull up for a little bit. Um, now, where, <laughs> where were we? Um, look, through the week, um, well, last week I showed you my little little hammer I bought with a with the little plastic ends that we, we were thinking of making a copper or a lead or a brass hammer out of or something like that. Well, um, well part, of, part of doing my lathe motor yesterday I noticed that the um, the belts were crook and there was a there was a belt that actually had a split right through it it's, it's a pair of belts um, right next to each other and I noticed one of them was split and it was still hanging in there doing the job so I went to town to grab a couple of belts and um, also on the side you've got your main drive gear coming out of your gearbox then you have your intermediate gear or your idler gear goes down onto your feed gear box on your apron and the bearings in that the, the, there's been a little bit of a noise come into the lathe recently and, and I'd had the top off the gear box just to have a look and it, look it's lovely after um, I, I think it's excuse me a second I'll yeah um, <coughs> it's a 1911 oh, 2011 sorry um, model lathe and um, look I, I've used it an awful lot and, um, but anyway, I, I, after I first bought it, I serviced it. I, I, I played with it for a while. And then I serviced it, changed all the oils and freshened everything up, get all the running in rubbish out. And, um, and I haven't sort of done it since. And, but anyway, I pulled the top off the gearbox, had a nice look inside. And, and well, geez, it's, it's in good order. There's no extra metal in there. There's no, no nothing. It's clean as a whistle in there, and, um, which is a good thing. But... It was getting a little bit of a, a noise coming in it, and I was wondering what it was. And anyway, yesterday in the clean up, when I was sitting down low on a different angle, um, when I was sort of sorting the motor out and doing the belts and that, I noticed this intermediate gear that had two 6002 or three bearings inside there, and the cage was starting to come apart on that. So um, I also, while I was in town, I, the same place I bought the bearings from, I bought the belts from it. While I was there, they have a scrap pile, and the people that bought the business, the business only been going 18 months or so, and um, they, have, they have a, a pile of stuff there, you can have a bit of a scrummage through, and um, while they're measuring belts and buggering around, they had a look in there, and well, look at this, inch and a quarter copper bar, and Thirteen inches long, a little bit over thirteen inches long, and it so happens that the um, the, the little plastic hammer I have that I bought the other day, you know, that'll be just lovely for some nice soft ends. So I think I'll do brass one end, copper the other end on this little hammer, and they were happy to get rid of it. They said when they bought the business, it was consignment stock. <coughs> Pardon me, it was stock that they had um, that just come with the business. It was all thrown in sort of thing. So, so they were happy to um, do a bit of a deal and, and get rid of it for me, um, to me. So um, that wasn't bad at all. And <coughs> another thing I did through the week was um, I chucked a little bit of metal in the lathe and I was looking for a metric drawbar for the milling machine. And as you may recall, um, some of the some of the bits and pieces that I've collected for my mill um, over the years, it seems to be a half inch Whitworth um, thread holding up as a drawbar, or 12 millimeters. And, and over the time, I'd I'd never had a 12 millimeter drawbar, but I made one once out of threaded rod. Um, and anyway, I've, I don't know where it's gone. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I hadn't used it for some time. And, I'd say when we shifted the stuff out of the out of the business, it 
just got my laid in there somewhere. So, so anyway, I made a, I made a, made a drawbar. So, with the drawbar, I thought, well, that'll be a great little project. I'll make a nut for it. And I see people making bits and pieces in their YouTube channels, you know, nuts for things. And I thought, well, damn it, it's got to be good fun, you know, doing that stuff. But where do you get time? Because by the time I go to work, then I, I come home and I do these workshop jobs and. Um, this last week I've done an injection pump for someone and, and make these bushes and a couple of forts and pins on the milling machine and things like that. And um, I find I'm just not getting much time to, to play or to fiddle. Uh, it's all play to me, but um, I don't get much time to do things like that. So I thought, well, a little nut, a 12 mil flange nut, would be good to make. And in, I have a 12 millimetre clamp down kit for the milling machine. And I thought... <coughs> One of the one of the nuts here would be ideal. So, but I hopped on my favourite one of my favourite um, um, machinery tool buying sites, um, and there's one called Aussie A U -S, S E E on eBay, and they have a separate store as well, and um, which you get stuff cheaper out of than eBay. And I had a look there, and they had two 12 mil nuts for the clamp kits with the flange already on it, which is something that is good. Um, 98 cents each nut or something like that. So I thought, look, I, I really haven't got the time to play. I'll, um, I'll just buy a couple of nuts. So I, I was buying some other stuff anyway. So <coughs> I may have got the cost a bit this morning. And so um, so I bought the nuts for the draw bar. So that'll, that'll sort that little problem out. And um, uh, with my um, with my collets, I've had an ER32 collet set for some time, and I, um, whenever I'm using a, an end mill or something like that on the mill over behind me here, um, I use most likely it's an ER32 collet I've been using. But I've thought I've got a um, I've got a 5C collet set for my lathe, and, and up in the centre. Um, if you take the chuck off up in the centre of the lathe, there's a um, there's a taper that will take that, and you put the draw bar through and, and do it. But it's a bit of a rigmarole and to do it, and, um, and yeah, I sort of find uh, I'd rather have the chuck on. The chuck seems to give you some flywheel momentum, um, which you know, no, you don't never. I just seem to like it. And, and so anyway, at Aussie, um, I see an ER thirty two collet chuck and so an ER32 collet chuck and they, they have them in uh, 100 millimeter backing plate or 125 and, and I've noticed on other YouTube channels um yeah John Mills and Double Boost and, um, he seems to have one that he just bops in his forge or and I thought well that's a great idea because um <clears throat> if I do if, if I do want to put something yeah, I could adjust, I could adapt the 5C, uh, the Morse 5 taper in my in the hollow drive shaft of my lathe. I could put a an adapter in, like a, a Morse taper adapter, back to um, Morse taper three, and put the collet chuck out of the lathe in there. But then you can't put anything long in there. It's it's a it's a set distance. So so with this being um, a hole all the way through, this is a good way for me to. Um, uh, to use the five, well, use the ER32 collets in the lathe um, just to hold the small stuff and nice and quick. You know, I've got the spanner and just pop it in, change collets, and away you go. And I, I have the full collet set. <coughs> I mean, full collet set um, with ER32 goes up to 19 or 20 millimeters. And so I thought, well, that, that'll be a, a good little tool for the business, and, um, well, to do the business. And, and so That'll um, that'll settle in the lathe. I'll try it out later. I've, I, I still have to finish these now. I've got the lathe going so on Sunday morning here, and um, but with the ER32, um, I've been finding in the milling machine it's only a little mill, and um, in the milling machine only going to 20 mil. I see on eBay and that there's a lot of the cheaper um, or or stepped shank end mills, the second hand ones, and that they um, a lot of them are only. Um, a, a one inch shank and on my little milling machine it, it's got a Morse 3 taper so I can put a, 
um, a 16 mil chuck in there if I want to, or I can go up to 20 millimeters with the um, with the ER32. Yet I thought, well, it'd be a good thing to have an ER40 collet set or collet adapters to um, an ER40 goes up to that, and so. Well, I'm talking to my old mates at Aussie. <laughs> They'll love me. Oh, they'll get a Christmas card off them, I think. Um, they had an ER40 collet adapter, or collet holder, with a Morse 3 taper with a 12mm thread on the drawbar. So I thought, well, that's a go. I'll, I'll buy that. But um, and now I thought, well, now I'm going to buy the collets. So I look in Australia and the, the collets for an ER40 can be $18, $20, $26 I saw one. And um, I thought, oh, I wasn't real keen on that. And so I found a site over in China um, that has the collets and that's, that's where they'd be coming from anyway, these other ones. And um, they're eight and nine dollars each. You know, a little shop in China, so um, yeah, one week I bought from inch down to 20 millimetres, I think. Then this last week I've just bought the uh, right down to four millimetres, I think it goes. And so we'll, we'll have a set of, <coughs> I mean, we'll have a set of ER40 collets to to use in the milling machine so I can do that. So, uh, look, while, <laughs> while, while you're there looking at things, um, bugger me if they didn't have one of these in ER40. So, I thought, well, it was looking lonely. I better, <laughs> I better, I better grab that. So, 125 millimeters again. Same story. Nice, clear, nice, nice through holes in it. And another thing that this does for us is, is like that. You could, um, I, I can just sit that in the milling machine and clamp something in it and you know mark it off or do whatever. Um, I should have a look at making an adapter for the um, rotary table but in saying that I, I don't really need to when I think about that a little more. Um, on my rotary table I have a four jaw chuck and I have a four jaw chuck because um, <coughs> that's, what, that's what I had and I've made an adapter plate for that and um, it's a six inch four jaw chuck and so look yeah to do anything like that I could just hold this in the four jaw chuck and, um, and then I could do multiple items if I wanted to. You, once, once we centralise this and, and true it up on the mill, um, problem solved. You can just take parts in and out or reposition them or whatever. So um, we'll probably we'll probably look at that. Um, that's something I hadn't thought of until now while I'm filming. <coughs> no, pardon me. I don't know what happened last night. That red wine should have been bloody good for me, I thought. But, and anyway, well. <laughs> While I was shopping, the basket wasn't full, and um, for 20 odd bucks they had some small hole gauges, a little, a little set of four, four hole gauges, and um, it, it goes from one, the, the, the smallest one's three to five mil, then five to seven and a half mil, um, seven and a half to ten, and ten to thirteen, so it goes up to about half inch, so I didn't have any of them, and I thought, oh, well, you know, while you've got the postman on the go, it doesn't cost any more in post to chuck that in the box, does it? So, so we did that, bought that, then the, the, while I was snooping around in there, and um, I'm really going to be in the Christmas card list, the, uh, I come across one of these Sanderson plates, and some of you may or may not know what a Sanderson plate is, but... Um, <coughs> Normally, one of these plates, they're used for sharpening end mills on a surface grinder. And on a surface grinder, um, you hold this on the magnetic chuck, it's, it's got the built-in angles. Um, <coughs> it has an angle built in already. And that angle is for doing the cutting edge on an end mill. So um, what they had was a it's an ER32 chuck once more and it, it's indexable. Round the, round the end of here can you see the 
It's got 12 indexing marks. And, and so you can do a few different end mills on it. And so, yeah, if you're doing a four flute end mill, you, you sit it up, you, you, you start on zero. This little screw, it's got a flat end on it, but the hole's tapered, so I need to just um, machine or grind the end of that screw so it locates a little bit better. Um, but look, on, on that first surface, you put your end mill in, clamp it down on your magnetic chuck and do your cutting surface. Then turn it around 90 degrees, do your cutting surface if it's a full flute mill and away you go. Then you bring it up onto this one and you do the clearance. So what I've been thinking of doing with it is I have a magnetic chuck and it's a magnetic chuck off the flywheel grinder and it's a strong thing but it's it's 400 around and it will fit on my milling machine if I put one two three blocks under it and clamp it down on my milling machine it will fit there so I could actually clamp this on was my plan and have a play with end mills now to do the grinding Hang on a minute, I'll come right back. I have a, I have a little stone I could have got out of. And to hold on to an end mill in here, uh, the idea I had was I have this aluminium grinding stone with diamond on the outside here. It's a diamond impregnated grinding stone. And my idea was to hold this in the, on the magnetic chuck and bring this across and being a nice distinct edge I should have control over where that edge goes in, compared with the end mill so when it's on the angle it would have to come in this side and that would give the give the cutting edge and so in the, in the past what I've done for gear cutters and all that I've, I've made arbors and this is a little arbor I made when I was cutting a gear for the um, my little engine I was playing with and, I've got a little dowel in there as a key and um, the idea is to make another arbor to fit this inch and a quarter hole or make a space, well probably make a, make a dedicated arbor so it's nice and true <coughs> and, and this goes perfectly true and this can come and sharpen end mill so well, that's, that's the thought behind that um, we'll just see and, um, see how we go with that. It'll be some time before I actually get to do that. Um, the limitations with that is that um, I have some more three end mills and they would, well I could make an adapter. If I, if I made an adapter from ER32 collet, or well, you can buy them I believe, can't you? Um, a Morse three female socket with a say a straight three quarter end or It'll probably be half inch in, but by the time it gets way out there, it, it may be too much of it sticking out. But look, we'll, we'll worry about that. We'll think about that as as we get closer to doing it. And um, uh, another thing, <laughs> while we're shopping, and um, is uh, these Noga. Look, it's a Noga knockoff. Um, I in the past I've had a couple of little ones, and that's the. That's the difference. And I, I bought a couple of these as camera stands. Make a little adapter that goes in here uh, with a quarter UNC thread on it. And then I can sit the camera up. But the, the little ones weren't quite... Well, I thought it moved a bit much. I wasn't that comfortable with it. And um, so I ordered a couple of these little blokes. And these fellas, they oh, they need tightening up on the screw and that, but um, but look, what I'm going to do with them, I've, I'm going to make a camera adapter for it. The, the other adapter should be fine, but I'm going to set these up, one for the mill and one for the lathe. Um, I've got a, I've had dial indicators and dial test indicators, so I'll set one up in each, because the other ones I have are the old lever type where you fiddle around and, and do that, so. <coughs> but with buying that, um, they were fifteen dollars each, so cheap as chips. And the surprise was when I got the kit, um, the people were looking after me, and they gave me 
a free little one with each big one on board. So that gives me four of these little ones now, and um, yeah, two of the big ones. So plus I've got the old type magnetic stand. So so we should have enough to make a few little gadgets and gizmos for um, you know, holding a light or. Um, um, I got some great little LED torches, and I was thinking um, sometimes when you want to look up the bore or something, it'll just be handy to make an adapter, a little round adapter, drop in with an LED torch, and and you could you could drop the torch in wherever you wherever you felt you needed to, and clamp him on, and you could actually look up a bore on the lathe or something like that. So, um, and I haven't seen anyone do that. So, but yeah, little LED torches, um, they're, they're a couple of bucks, you know, five bucks, and they they have a great light, and they have a um, an adjustable focal point on the front so you can have it wide or, or back in and I thought and, and what got me thinking about that is, is boring these fellas out you look at them and you've got your head down you're trying to get the light in so you can see that you're not going to bottom out and, and wreck something which is another thing I wrecked <laughs> on the week <coughs> pardon me <coughs> oh, I've got the coughs bad um, when I was coming in doing the hole here with the boring bar, I had the boring bar at 90 degrees. And when I come to the end, it had drip. And anyway, I, I set the DRO so I'd come up on it and, you know, 10th hour before it would actually touch, I'd, I'd pull it up and I'd just go up by hand. But anyway, I, I must have been having a bit of a brain fart and, and let it go too far. She bit and bloody bang, the thing got out of true. And yeah, <laughs> anyway. I had to set it all up again and get it going, so yeah, what we ended up doing was set the, I mean, instead of the boring bar going in straight, we brought it back on a slight angle, so it was just the tip touching, so if I, if I went up to the end there and I misjudged, I wasn't paying attention, I had a brain fart I call them, um, and I, I went in 5th hour, 10th hour too deep, I wasn't going in with the full surface area of the tool and, you know, shaking shit out of it and breaking stuff, but it, I, had a, I had a margin for error and then in the end we just... Bring the, bring the tool across after the job and tidy this up here and then just trim this and job done. So so I broke a tip out of one of the, <laughs> one of the bloody boring bars doing that. Um, I, I knew it was going to happen. You know, one of those things, you, you, you chug along and you, I don't know, you seem to have your bloody brain in neutral sometimes. Or I find after a day's work, I, I come home and I head up the shed here to do more work for the, for the business and... Um, You've got your mind on the day stuff, you're not concentrating properly, so anyway, we'll, we'll sort that out, I think. And um, another thing that we got just today, it's Father's Day in Australia today, and, um, and the first Sunday in September is Father's Day, and the missus said, what do you want for Father's Day? And I said, oh, a chip cooker. She says, bloody chip cooker? What do you want a chip cooker for? And because um, we don't, we don't have one in the kitchen at home. Well, we don't eat fried food much. We, we barbecue things and, and, um, and do camp oven cooking and all that, but we don't have a chip cooker. And um, the idea of the chip cooker is um, to heat bearings. And I want a chip cooker for up the back here. And we used to have one at the shop. And, um, and what we do with bearings, yeah, you know, everyone knows you expand something, or you heat something and it expands. And, um, and the, with bearings, it's the same. So <coughs> um, you, you put a, you, you fill the chip cooker up with transmission oil or hydraulic oil or something like that. And uh, I used to use transmission oil mostly because the bearings I was doing were on gearboxes on big John Deere's and things like that. So, um, so the transmission oil has a flash point of oh, three. I think last time I read it, it sticks in my head at three twenty degrees C, and um, and these things only go up to like. Yeah, 200, two, two something. So um, you've got a margin for error there. So, so what you do with the bearing is you um, you get the chip cooker going on the bench here with a bit of tranny oil in, and you heat the bearing up in it, and you you chuck the bearing in for quite a while. Like yeah, you know, give it five or ten minutes for the for the heat to actually get deep into the bearing, and then um, and we particularly used them on the grey Fergie axles on the TE20 axles, and and you. You'd get the seal on and get it all greased up and ready, and then you'd you'd sit the axle here out of the breeze, and then you'd put the chip cooker just near your job there, and um, and you'd grab the bearing out with your moldies and just sit it over the shaft and plop, she'd just plop on and that was it. It, it would lock onto the shaft and, and it would go right down. You could you, you still had a hammer and a punch in case you hadn't 
or a case it cocked on you or something like that, which didn't happen often. So, so anyway, the missus bought me a chip cooker. So um, we, before we knew about chip cookers, um, we used to heat bearings in electric fry pans. And we'd set the electric fry pans to flat out. And um, it flat out when you, you know, your little light on your handle, when the light would come on and off, it was cycling on and off a little bit, that's when you dropped the bearing in. Or we would put the bearing in and let it heat up until it got to there. Um, if we only had one or two, we'd drop the bearings in. Give you a big surface area fry pan and an oil only about so high. So we used to just put a little bit of wire mesh in the bottom of the fry pan and pop the bearings on, let it heat up. And as soon as it was cycling, you know, and you'd seen it do a few cycles, you knew it was getting up to temperature. The bearing would have come up with it and you could do that. But then later on we found out about chip cookers. So, uh, so yeah, we used the chip cookers and it seemed to, oh, it seemed to be a bit better. And for a workshop, um, with a chip cooker, you put the lid back on and you can use the same oil many times and it, it stays good. You don't use it for anything else, it's just, it's just a, um, a conductor for the heat to get into the bearing. But um, with the fry pans, when you were picking the fry pan up full of oil, because you've got to have it so full and the thing's only this high, it'd slop on the floor and you'd try and get it on the shelf and put it away and then the lid would get bumped sideways. and You'd light it up and there'd be moths and honey <laughs> rubbish in it. So we found chip cookers are better. So. So we went along with that. Oh, another thing was when I bought the 4C collet chuck, you don't get a spanner with it, so I had to send and get a spanner. So that's a um, little working okay. But um, well, look, that's about it for today um, for this kangaroo stew. Um, I still have jobs to do, like make the plate over on the milling machine for the hold the injection pump, um, for doing the injection pump up. I have an injection pump I need to do up for a fella, and I have to do it this weekend. And, um, but I was going to try and make the plate first, and that was yesterday morning's job um, before the lathe shit itself, and we lost a day there. So, anyway, we'll see. So, but I may have some machining, and I may not. We'll just see how the day goes and what interruptions we get. But, um, anyway, I'll catch you later, eh?